Right, now we're going to dive into God's Word. Please take out your Bibles. Also, the handout sheet that was given to you at the front door. If you're watching online, you need to fire up the app, right? We didn't hand anything to you. That would be creepy. All right. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. You're going to need to look at the fill in the blank. We're kicking off with that. Remember, we're in part six of our James series entitled Discovering Practical Christianity. Here's the fill in the blank. You ready? Selfishness is a root of all kinds of evil. Selfishness is a root of all kinds of evil. Would you agree with me that selfishness just flat out makes us mean? Right? The whole concept of me first ruins everything. It causes us to be monsters. Now, I'm going to give you four reasons why it's so dangerous to live with a me first or a selfish lens. Just write these down. This is just an intro. I'm going to go through them real fast. Number one, we see opponents and obstacles instead of friends and ministry. We see opponents and obstacles instead of friends and ministry. What am I saying? When we live me first, other people are in our way. When we live others-centered, people aren't the problem. They're the point. When someone comes up in front of you and they cause a problem, you would go, oh, your ministry, right? Not you need to get out of my way, not you're my problem. You start seeing God has given me something, how do I use it to minister to you? Not, I can't believe you would come at me like that, right? Because if we're thinking about our priorities, our agenda, we got stuff to do and people are getting in our way. Hold on. They are the way. Our whole point, we're in the people business, right? Our Jesus rescued us to bring transformation to other people. We share the gospel. We share his love, yes? They aren't a problem. They're the point. Number two, if we live with a selfish lens, we tend to tell God no. We tend to tell God no. When we tell God no, we are saying we are king and you are not. That is highly offensive, yeah. right? In a world where you are encouraged that your opinion is just as important as everybody else's opinion, you start seeing God's word as an opinion. That is incorrect. By the way, not everybody's opinion is equal, right? God's opinion is light years better than whatever we're gonna come up with, amen? All right, number three, danger of living selfishly, we lose our peace and joy. We lose our peace and joy. The more selfish we are, the more disappointing the world becomes. It will never be enough for us. The good times aren't good enough. The special moments aren't special enough. And the praise we receive will never satisfy. The result of selfishness is living in bitterness and disappointment because the world was never set up to serve us. If we live selfishly, we got nothing but bitterness to come. But when you live for God and you live for other people, man, joy and peace can flow because whether or not your station is perfect isn't the number one priority. Number four, danger of living selfishly. We become easy puppets for the enemy. We become easy puppets for the enemy. Selfish people are easy pickings. And here's why. You're already bent for disappointment. All the enemy has to do is whisper a thought and you'll spiral out, right? Here's what'll happen. If you are thinking only of you, he can blow by and just whisper this. Dude, I think they were talking about you. Boom, walk away. Slip right back into the darkness. Why? Because then you're like, oh, they were talking about what were they saying? And then our minds just go, 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 go. Right? All he has to do is walk by and go, do you really think that you're enough to handle this? Boom, drift. Right? When you're already prone to looking and overanalyzing and navel-gazing, you understand what I'm talking about? When you are so into you, you're easily manipulated. 
But when you're about Jesus and other people, Satan tries to blow by and he's like, hey, that person's talking about you. And you said, what? There's ministry where? (laughs) Right? I mean, it just automatically ruined his whole point. Yeah? God wants us to see life through the lens of what can we allow him to pour out through us. Amen? That's what we're supposed to do. We are here to bring healing in Jesus' name. We are here to bring love in Jesus' name. We're here to bring truth in Jesus' name. That's what we do. People aren't a problem. They're here to be loved, and they are precious. Amen? Amen. All right, so we're going to dive into the book of James. Would you turn there with me? We're in James chapter 3, verse 13 today. James chapter 3 verse 13. Now, anytime you see the Bible have an author get really riled, get angry, especially if it's like Jesus or if it's uh, somebody like James or Paul, when they get really mad, almost always they're talking to leaders. Why? Once again, influence. They can hurt people with their influence. Think about how Jesus was. He was pretty chill with tax collectors and sinners, is that correct? I mean, he was just like sweet and kind and encouraging. When he got locked in with the Pharisees and the religious leaders, he starts throwing bombs. You whitewash tombs, you, and you're like, whoa, Jesus, what is going on, right? Paul's the same way, very kind to the oppressed, very kind to the prostitute, very kind to all, But when it came to a religious leader being selfish, boom, that lights up. James is going to be real intense today because he's talking primarily to the leadership of the church. Now, this is where you go, oh, good, I don't have to be convicted. Okay, hold on a second. (laughs) Remember, we teach here at Bridgeway, everybody is a leader, priesthood of all believers. That means if you have influence anywhere, your friends, your work, your school, you are a leader. It applies to you. Because here's the truth. The truth is, we need to realize, is there anything in what God is saying that I can apply to my life? We need to soak that in, because I would hate to miss the revelation of God, right? And here's the thing. You don't need to cause the problem to learn from the problem. Here's my point. It's a very firstborn thing to do. I am a thirdborn, right? Which means that I am entitled and spoiled. We don't need to get into that. (laughs) But I am a thirdborn, and here's what I learned, right? That I can learn from other people's whoopings, okay? (laughs) So here's the deal. I do not need to do something wrong to find out what the boundaries are. I wait till my brother got in trouble or my sister got in trouble. I would then mark that down, don't do that. I don't understand some of you people that need to do it yourself, right? My backside is very thankful. Do you understand what I'm saying? That I'm learning from other people's mistakes, okay? So the Bible's written that we would learn from their mistakes and not have to make them ourselves, all right? Everything you read, always check. Holy Spirit, what does that have to do with me? What does it have to do with me? We try to apply it. Now, last week was Karen Compassion Expo. Did you guys enjoy last weekend? Man, it was powerful, yeah? Like, um, we not only had like this, this interview on stage with these people giving their lives to the Lord and missionary work, but we had a whole lobby packed with powerful ministries, some from all over the world, right? It was so exciting, and I was so proud of you. The way you were engaging with the missionaries, the way you're engaging with local outreach. It was absolutely beautiful. Now, that caused a pause in the book of James. So we got to jump another week back to remember what I talked about then. I do not pretend like you guys are at home going, hmm, what did Lance talk about? Okay, you don't even know my name. All right. So here's what we talked about two weeks ago. We were talking about the power of words. Words have the ability to raise up and the ability to tear down. When leaders use words, it's even a bigger deal. And James said this, because of the influence, not many of you should want to be leaders. They will be held to a stricter judgment. You all remember that? 
ah, that stricter judgment is about to come to roost right now. Look with me in James chapter 3, verse 13. Here's what he says. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't brag about it or lie about it. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above. It is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But wisdom from above is first of all pure, then peaceable, then gentle, then open to reason, full of mercy, full of good fruit, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. All right, pause. What in the world did he just say? That was a lot of flowery language, right? Let me tell you exactly what he's talking about. First thing to understand the context is in the Jewish culture, their leaders were purveyors of wisdom. And you go, what what are you talking about? Well, they would look at their leaders as sharing what is right and good for life. You go, okay, what's your point? Well, who ultimately is the only one that knows what is right and good for life? God. They were conduits for God's wisdom. Now, that's all good and right. I think it's very valuable. The problem is it is very sensitive to what? Distortion. When you have a leader that speaks for God, it's very tempting for that leader and people around them to start seeing them as a separate type of individual, right? Like you are high and lifted up. You're a different quality of human being. And they would be able to have an authority that would be appropriate, but it could get distorted into a power they would wield. Y'all tracking with me? So here was the concern. James calls them out. You guys call yourself wise and understanding. Step up. Who is it? Who are the leaders that I'm talking to? Because I will pull the curtain back and I will expose you right now. If you were truly wise and discerning, I'd be able to tell it through your life. I'm not seeing anything out of your life. Here's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing a lot of chat. I'm seeing a lot of talk and I'm just not seeing you back it up. So this whole business about you're a big deal and we can't ever hold you accountable and talk, that is not a thing. As a matter of fact, I want to see it. I want to see it. And this is interesting. When something is put into a religious context, it starts getting a little tricky. Uh, For example, you would see your boss at work outside the church and you would kind of know your roles. When I go to 9 to 5, they're in charge when it comes to company things. When it comes to church or religious stuff, it starts to bleed into a bunch of things. I don't want you to raise your hands, but I would venture to say that a lot of us have what is called church wounds. You understand what I'm talking about? Church wounds are when you have been hurt by either another Christian or by a leader in the church. And the reason why those are unique is because it crosses multiple roles. For example, let's say a child is abused by a parent. The role is confused because they said, you are both my protector and my abuser. And I don't know what to do with that. Like, when are you what? How do I know when you're safe and when you're a monster? Like, I can't figure it out, and I don't have anywhere else to go. So it creates a lot of trauma that has to be unwound. Is that correct? In the church, it's very similar. If a church leader hurts you, you kind of attach it to God, right? Well, 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 hold on. Who, who just came at me? Who is it? Who did, did God just fire me? Like, what just happened here, right? Like, you're being mean to me, but I kind of see you as a God figure. So, wait, if God hurt me, where do I go for healing? Does that make sense? 
So church wounds are very tricky to try to iron out. And that's why James comes at them so strongly. Guys, you don't get to put on a shroud and hurt people and put like a religious veneer on it, right? Uh, let's say, you know what, pastor, I just wanted to say real quick, I feel, like, I feel like what you said to me the other day, man, that really crushed my heart. I was speaking for the Lord. What do you do with that? I don't even know what to do with that, right? I hate arguments where somebody says in the church, God told me. What am I supposed to say to that? There's no debate. No, he didn't. Yeah, he did. No, he didn't. All right, cool. Now we're done. Like, it's a dumb conversation because what ends up happening is that's a defense mechanism. It's an excuse. So you end up going, wait, wait, wait. I don't, hold on. I don't think you were speaking for God. I think you were being mean human. But now you're putting, like, religious stuff on it. You're freaking me out. Does that make sense? So James calls him to account. He said, if you were truly a good leader of Jesus, I would be able to see it in your actions and your behavior. And here's what I'm seeing in the church today, James said. Two things, bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. Bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. If you're a bad guy, you don't get to brag about it. You don't get to hide it in religious terms. We gotta call it for what it is. You want to be a big deal because you want to be a big deal. Don't put some religious lens on it. Y'all, we're going to be doing a building campaign for a statue of me out front. And you're like, wait, what? Well, I will be out there holding a Bible like this. And you're like, okay, what do you, why would you do that? I'm just saying, it's just a way of showing that the word of God is important. It's a way of showing that preaching is important. Hold up, I think you just wanna see your face in bronze, right? This whole business about you're trying to put some weird religious lens on it. Dude, you wanna be a big deal. We all wanna be a big deal. You're wrestling with your flesh just like we do. But because you're a pastor or a leader, you get to put some weird jargon to it. I just think you're a regular human being struggling. Y'all tracking with me? Ah. Yep. Uh, he said, if you really want to know what a good leader's like, let me tell you, here's what you should be seeing. First of all, he gives a list. First of all, purity, that is Christ-like integrity, moral integrity that flows in your behavior and your attitude. They are peaceable. They have peace inside and outside. They're not interested in getting other people to fight for no reason. If they cause agitation, it better be for the betterment of the church. You don't just get to slay everybody and be mean. That's not a thing. You are to be gentle, considerate, not hardcore letter of the law. Where is the grace? If you're a great leader, you are dedicated to what is right. You keep your passions in check. You would be unbiasedly merciful to everyone. You don't just have your crew that you're nice to and mean to everybody else. You can't create divisions, factions. That's not from the Lord. You should be full of doing good to other people for their benefit, not your benefit. You should be untainted by hypocrisy. So James just throws the curtain back and says, guys, you're out of line. Now, this is coming from the pillar of the church. This is coming from the bishop of the first Jerusalem church. James is kind of a big deal. So he had to step into that gap, pull the curtain back, and go, stop it. You're hurting people, and we don't do that. Right? Oh, all right. Now, let me just give a little bit of uh, humanity to all of this. Obviously, I'm talking about church leaders, so we're looking at me, right? Have I, church, have I caused church wounds? Yes, I have. Did I do them intentionally? No, I did not. But did I cause them? Yes. Here's what's intriguing. I was just talking with a buddy the other night. We tend to see ourselves as regular folks, so we try to act like regular folks. Well, here's what regular folks do. They vent their anger, when a normal person vents their anger, it's one thing. When a church leader does it, 
the person looking backwards is seeing the mantle of God upon them. Y'all, I've gotten some pretty mean emails, right? Questioning this, arguing about that. And you know what I've done? I flamed them. You guys know what that is? Man, that has taken all my talents and abilities, and I'm correcting them. Do you understand what I'm saying? Boom, right? And everyone's like, you know, Lance, you should probably set those aside for a moment and think about it. I was like, but that will not make me feel better, right? And I'm just like, they must die, you know, and it's like I have to fire back. Okay, because as a normal human being, what they did hurt me and I wanted to make it right. The problem is I'm wearing Jesus clothes. So what's coming out of me has more weight to it. And they went, whoa, 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 you're not regular. What you said to me hurt me worse. Y'all, I've done that. I didn't do it to be mean. I didn't do it thinking of the clothes I was wearing. But I need to, amen? So, but those are hard to heal. Okay? Once again, I never want to appear like I am not putting myself under the authority of Jesus Christ, right? Let's call it what it is, yeah? Let's pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 4. He said, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet, you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel about it but you don't have because you don't ask me. And then you ask and don't get it because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Pause. What causes fights with people? I want you to think back on a couple arguments you've had recently. What was it really about? Have you ever, have you ever had an argument where you and someone were arguing so long you forgot what you were arguing about? Man, okay, this is a perfect example, right? It's because, well, let, me get, let me give you, let's say, for example, you were going to unload the dishwasher. Yeah, you go in, you open the dishwasher, and someone from the pit of hell have the forks going up. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, once again, I'm not saying it's in the Bible. I am, I am saying that I'm speaking from the pulpit. Let's be very clear here. Forks always go down. Do you understand what I'm saying? And the reason why is I do not want to slice my hand reaching in there. And I don't want your grubby paws on my tongs. You understand what I'm talking about? All right, so Christians put them facing down. Okay. (laughs) That's not true at all. Okay. (laughs) Total lies. Let's say you're super irritated and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you put the forks up. Right? And you're like, I even told you yesterday. And this whole argument erupts. Okay, is it really about forks in the dishwasher? It's not. It's a power struggle. I told you, you should listen to me. Does that make sense? And you start digging under it and you're going, wait, 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 wait. Not all disagreements and tensions are bad, but sometimes you're just trying to be the boss. And the other person's getting in your way. They're trying to be the boss too. When we get into the mode that our opinions are the only ones that matter, we're in trouble. But isn't that how we are with everyone that disagrees with us? How dare you have another opinion? (laughs) Who are you? And they're like, well, who are you? And I'm like, well, clearly nobody knows who we are. Does that make sense? (laughs) We have no idea who we are. James says at the heart of it, there are wars going on inside of us. What does that mean? It means this. You know that when someone gets on your last nerve, Jesus would give them grace and patience. You know that it's more important to win the relationship than the argument, right? But on the other hand, boy, are they irritating. You understand what I'm talking about? Like you got this war, like the little angels like bleep on one side, little devils on the other side, right? And it's kind of like, Jesus would handle this nicely. The other one's like, shut up, right? <laughs> you must hurt them, right? Okay, we have these wars going on inside. When we don't get what we want, we do terrible things. I want you to think about this. We've watched stuff happen on a national level, 
with one nation warring against another. We've seen it in our own lives. But let me ask you a question. Why would someone hurt someone else? It's so, it's so much work. Why wouldn't you just pretend like they don't exist? Why in the world would you want to go to war as a nation? It doesn't even make any sense because those of us that are lazy are like, wow, that's a lot of effort. You don't understand what I'm saying? Like, why wouldn't we just stay home and watch Netflix? But, but something is causing somebody to war and take over something else. There's a motivation. Okay, why would you bother hurting someone else? You gotta use all your air. Like, why would you even yell at somebody or, or, or say mean things about somebody else? Because you're getting something out of it. What are you getting out of it? Let's talk about that for a second. Why would a person murder someone else? Because by the way, murder is a lot of work. And you know what? You really have a chance to really go to jail. I'm just letting you know, okay? Why would they murder? To get something or to remove a challenge, right? Why would a person gossip? Because I want to feel like I have new, exciting information. You'll pay attention to me, even if it costs the reputation of someone else. Why is there domestic violence? Because they keep irritating. Are you watching what happens? Every scenario from national to personal is I, 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 I. Selfishness causes terrible things. Why does James use such extreme language? You fight, you quarrel, you murder, and you're like, whoa, are you guys having like a lot of murder problems? No, here's his point. The difference between a murderer and a racist is not one of quality, but quantity. We may not murder someone, but we've killed people in our hearts over and over and over. Do not pretend like your heart is more pure than a murderer's. It's just they went through with it. There is a commitment they were willing to put behind it. We will simply slaughter and the hatred will still grow in our hearts. We have to be careful on this whole idea, those people, right? Those people are bad. Though, hold on. We have problems that we need to submit to the Lord because our hearts aren't right sometimes. Y'all tracking with me? Yep, okay, three people are, praise the Lord. <laughs> Here's the interesting thing to me. When we get in bad moods and we're in a selfish mindset, we learn how to do adult temper tantrums. Now, just, it's funny, kids do stuff that is, <laughs> so the, the other day, I, I was, we were at an event, and I was, I was looking over, and I saw Josh Oot. His kids were playing over in the grassy area, and there's a bunch of adults doing things, and his youngest son, Declan, little guy, was bored out of his mind. And so he was on the grassy area, and I watched him. I was, he didn't know I was watching him. I watched him, and he was like looking around for something to do, and so he just falls on the ground and rolls. And I'm like... Is that the game? Like, that's not a game. Like, rolling is not a game. He's like, yeah, it is. I was bored. I'm rolling. And you're like, oh, okay. Kids will just do stuff, right? As adults, that's weird, right? If you were in, in Rayleigh's and you're like, Ugh, and you just start rolling on the ground. <laughs> you know, you're like, oh, let's hurry up. Okay. So we end up trying to put it through a lens of what adults do. And here's what adults do to throw adult temper tantrums. We make weird noises. Uh, pff, uh, pff, uh, pff, uh. You're like, what are you doing? Are you trying to beatbox? Like, what are you trying to do here? And then we start doing, the, my, the one that cracks me up the most is when adults heavy walk. And you're like, you're stomping like a child. What are you, we're slamming doors and we're, we understand that we have to put it through some acceptable lens, but we're venting out our anger. Why? Because we don't feel good. I don't feel right. Something made me mad. Y'all tracking? It'd be, it'd be nice if at some point we all grew up, but we don't, right? We just keep morphing it, <laughs> right? Okay. Where's God's help in all this? God said, you know what? You keep 
complaining about what you don't have. You're not even asking me. You're like, yeah, I did. And he's like, hold on, honey. Here's what you actually prayed. Lord, blow up the head of my neighbor. Okay, I'm not doing that. That is unacceptable. I understand you have a fence problem, but I don't need to decapitate them. Stop asking for dumb things. Good parents have to sift requests. He said, I don't give you the things you're asking for because they're coming from such a selfish place. So yes, I'm going to tell you no. Dad, can I have more candy? No, you're a spaz right now. Does that make sense? Pick it up in verse four. You adulterous people. Dang. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend with the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says God yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. All right, what is he talking about? You adulterous people. Was there a serious adultery problem? No, he's using an Old Testament concept called spiritual adultery. It's a big deal that God busted Israel on over and over. Here was his point. Everything with God that matters is relational, okay? Love me with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Is that not the essence of what we're supposed to do? Love your neighbor. It's all relational, right? So what God says is, if I am king and you are going to want to be with me and give me your heart, I need total devotion, absolute fidelity. Therefore, kind of like you guys do your marriage thing, right? Hey, I really love you. Let's go in front of people, witnesses, sign a license, and we get married. You have a contract that holds fidelity. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. You do the same thing with me. I'm telling you, I don't want you to have any other gods before me. I need to be your number one, and I need your whole heart. Yeah? Yes. Cool. I'm faithful to you. You be faithful to me. But what do we do? Just like Israel did. Oh, there's a new God in town. I want to go serve that God. Oh, well, this gives me more power. This gives me more options. And we keep going out on God. He said, you spiritually adulterous people. You're breaking my covenant and you're breaking my heart. Wow, that's power, right? That's, that's pretty strong. He said, when you want to be friends with the world, you become an enemy of me. Hold on, let's unpack that. What do you mean friends with the world? Like I can't have friends in the world that aren't Christian? No, no, no. The term world in this context means that which is anti-God in society. Not everything in society is bad. There's tons of good, there's bad, okay? The parts that are anti-God is called the world. When you make friendship with them, you're going into partnership with them. You're investing your resources into them. When you do that, you are obviously now an adversary to God because it's anti-God. Make sense? He said, you keep playing this. I want to keep one foot in one world one foot in the other world and think I can appease both. You cannot. You will either be friends with that which is anti-God or you will be pro-God. That's it. He said, but because I know you're broken, I still have more grace for you. And this is the sweetness of God, right? Think about this. Maybe some of you just came to church for this one phrase. Your sin doesn't change God's nature. Like on your worst day, God is still grace filled. He doesn't allow your sin to alter who he is. He's like, kiddo, when you're sweet and cuddly with me on the couch, you know what? I have so much grace for you. But when you're a total brat, I have the same amount of grace 
for you. Your world doesn't change my world. I got grace for you. But you want to get on my bad side, I oppose the proud but give grace to the humble. You want to tick God off? Be prideful. Why? Well, that's what took Satan down, and it didn't go super well. He even took Adam and Eve down. He's been playing the same game. Don't be prideful. Be a softy. God's really nice to softies. Okay, here we go. Pick it up in verse 7. How do we fix it all? Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. All right? If the church that James is talking about is so messed up, if leadership is so messed up, how do we get back on track? Stop making it worse. I love this quote. First rule in getting out of a hole. Stop digging. <laughs> Amen? And so he's like, all right, guys, if you are in rebellion to me, first rule, stop doing it. Submit to me and begin to own up to what you did. Bring it to me. Talk about it. Confess. Right? And here's the interesting thing. He says, the devil's all over you taking advantage of this. How do you get rid of him? Resist him and he will flee. Now, that's so encouraging. It means that whatever spiritual attack that is on you is temporary. I know it feels really, really long. He said, resist him and he'll eventually leave. Why would he leave? I mean, I was thinking about this, just trying to ponder. Why would, why would a demon leave? I mean, he's harassing you, right? Yeah, but what if it's not working? This is interesting to me. God is the only being that is omnipresent. Is that correct? He can be everywhere at all at the same time. Anything else is a created being, which means they are limited. They may be able to flip dimensions. They may be able to be really fast. They may be able to go through solid matter, stuff like that. But they can only be in one place at one time. What does that mean? When they're harassing you, they're not harassing someone else. And if you're a problem child and you aren't having it and you're rebuking them and clinging to Jesus and saying, you don't get to do this to me. When you are resist, 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 they're like checking their watch. Man, I got other stuff I could be doing. I'm out of here. And they leave. Resist the devil. Stop partnering with him. I'm going to let my thoughts spiral. I'm going to be, have self-hatred. I'm going to... Stop. Submit to God. Change your mind. Agree with him. That's what repentance means. He said, and I want you to cleanse your hands and your hearts. And what I really want you to do is to give your hearts over to me. But I don't... Well, this is not a playing time. This is not a laughing matter. If you're going to own it, I want you to own it. Because this whole business of I'm just going to ask God for forgiveness but not really care about it, it's not really a thing. Are you really owning your stuff? Okay. If you do, I've promised you in my word, God said. If you confess your sins, I will be faithful to forgive you of those sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But I need you to own it. Right? He closes out with this. He said, before we go, let me... Let me share something with you. Verse 11. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers and sisters. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, you're a judge. There's only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and destroy. But who are you again to judge your neighbor? All right. I want to talk about this because this gets misused a lot, the whole idea of don't judge me, right? Okay, judgment in the Bible has a varying degree of intensity. It can mean discerning an answer. Hey, I see this math problem. It says two plus two, I'm going to determine or judge the answer is four. No big deal. 
There is nothing wrong with making determinations about things that you see. Oh, I'm looking at the fruit of that person's life. That's not good. Oh, I'm seeing this behavior. Not good. But we can also slide it all the way to the other side to do what only God does, which is determine people's identity. We're not allowed to do that, okay? And you go, well, hold on a second. Okay, let me give you another example. If a two-year-old comes up to you and says, your hair looks funny, that's different than a hairstylist who says, your hair looks funny, right? Judgments carry more weight, right? If a parent is judging their child's behavior, that's different than a judge in a courtroom judging their child's behavior. Is that correct? Okay, so you have varying judgments. Here's what he's calling out. Who are you to close the book and say what another person is? So what we need to do in our processing is use a different phrase, because here's what we'll say. You're an idiot. Do you understand what you just did? Because when you say you are an idiot, you locked it and said you'll never be anything more than an idiot. You are at your core being an idiot. Your identity is that you do not have knowledge or wisdom. Who are you to say that? You don't get to tell me what I am. You don't even have the right material to work with. You don't know where I've come from. You don't know my motivations. You don't know where God is heading with me. How can you make a determination on what I'm worth or who I am? You don't get to do that. You never get to close the book on somebody. They are a blank. We need to change our language to you are acting blank. Does that make sense? Because it's separating out from identity into an assessment of behaviors. Well, you're a baby. You're acting immature from my vantage point. That's a very different world because what happens is we easily slip into a God role. I know everything and I'm able to determine your value. Nobody, nobody's allowed to do that. There's only one judge and you're not it. Does that make sense? All right, so here's how we're gonna close out. <clears throat> we're gonna do a lot deeper version of this in tonight, but, but I wanted to take our time, last couple minutes, and I wanted to do a bit of a confession ownership of our situation and allowing in our confession God to have some cleansing of our lives to kind of like um, relationally restore. Does that make sense? And I want to do so through this lens. Y'all remember the story when Jesus washed the disciples' feet? You guys remember that? Like a famous one. Everyone always has the towel around his arm, right? You know, and he started, well, when he started washing the disciples' feet, they started freaking out because that's a very low level thing to do. And they're like, oh, this is so embarrassing. We should have washed your feet when you came in. We didn't do that. And he's like, I'm gonna wash your feet. And they're like, gosh, this is so awkward. That's what slaves do. I don't think I'm comfortable with this. And Jesus said, I'm teaching you a lesson. So he starts to wash their feet. He comes over to Peter, Mr. Extreme, and Peter's like, you can't wash my feet. It's not right. And Jesus is like, dude, if I don't wash your feet, nobody washes your feet. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm doing something powerful here. And he's like, what? Well, then wash my body as well. And he's like, oh, my goodness. God, tame it down, man. What? Why are you all extreme all the time? Okay, here's the deal, buddy. You don't need to wash your whole body. I've already cleansed you in the deepest place. Your spirit is mine. What you got on you is relational dirt. What you got on you is world dirt. I don't need to do a whole rebaptism and all that. Stop. You've been walking through a selfish world and you got a bunch of selfishness on you. Like I'm looking at how you've been hacking and stuff like that and you just got grime on you. And when I wash it, I know that's embarrassing because you have to own up to it, right? 
but I want to clean up so that you and I are good. That's what it's all about. When you confess to the Lord, remember two things. Number one, you're never going to tell him something he doesn't know. Right? It's almost like you're watching the kid take the cookie in the cookie jar. And then later on, they're like, oh, I got something to say. I took a cookie. You're like, yeah, I know. I was watching. Oh, well, you should have told me that beforehand. <laughs> Second thing, when you go to God with confession, you're walking up to a mature, grace-filled individual. He's literally going, kiddo, I've been waiting for you. I knew you did it. You've been carrying that weight on your shoulders for a long time. I appreciate you. Okay, what'd you do? Well, I was really mean to the other ki kids. And I know. Are you sorry? Yeah. You gonna do it again? I don't think so. <laughs> okay. Okay, we're good here. All right, go play. That's confession to the Father. Amen? We're going to go ahead and just pray and just do some of that, okay? After that, we'll have our prayer team come on up here. And if you need extra prayer, that's what they're here for, right across the front. Heavenly Father, in this beautiful holy moment, we want to own up to what we've done. God, some of us have been pretty mean lately we've been definitely really selfish and we've been lashing out and we've been trying to hide our flaws and manipulating people and using people and god we our thoughts quite frankly have been in the garbage and we're not making any excuses it is what it is you are always correct your assessment lord is right what we did, we may have done out of anger, pain, self, whatever it is, but we did it. And Lord, we're sorry. Just reflecting right now on the pain we've caused breaks our heart. So we're saying, Lord, we own it. Would you forgive us? Would you cleanse us? We have no desire to walk out and do it immediately again. But we need your help to not do it again. Every time I assess my sin, Lord, I'm always thinking that I'm capable of doing it again real fast. So I need your help. But Lord, I ask that you would cleanse us. So right now, Lord, with everyone that can hear my voice, as each and every one of us own up to it, would you rain down a sweet shower of cleansing? that you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness, cleanse us from all the yuck, cleanse us from all the sin, cleanse us from all the disgusting things that we have done. Lord, that we would be able to walk out of here feeling light, airy, our heads up high, joyful that our God is so kind and sweet. And Lord, that we would take that lightness and use it to bless somebody today. Would you clean us up, restore us in relationship with you to 100%. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Have a